Welcome to the Community-Based Adaptation Conference in Dhaka, Bangladesh. Uh, and we have a small break, so we've got a chance to nab one or two uh, important participants, and none more important, I think, than Nahao Rooney from the Manos Provincial Administration in Papua New Guinea. That's right? Uh, yes. What's, the, what's your actual uh, title when I say from the administration? Uh, I am in the policy area at the Manus Provincial Government Assembly and a member of the Manus Government Assembly and I'm the chairman of climate change, culture, tourism and health department. Right, and I know you've got a lot of experience on both sides of government and in business, and you've got awards, you're a CBE and a CMS. CMS is Commander of the Melanesian Star, is that right? Champion, Champion of the Melanesian okay. Star. Star, right, thank you. Okay, okay, yes, yeah, Papua New Guinea Award. Okay, well, I've got a star with me, so that's great. <laughs> um, okay, let's get straight into it, because I know you want to go and enjoy your short break from the work. Um, Papua New Guinea, do, are people aware of climate change? Um, it has become an issue that's being addressed and a lot of people are now hearing about the word climate change. And because the word climate change is an English word, people are a bit confused and they're not quite sure what it is. But when it comes to the reality about climate changes, Everyone in, Man in Papua New Guinea communities are aware, very well aware, of what is happening on the ground. Our weather is changing, there's a lot of like water, sea level rising, especially on the islands and coastal villages. There's a change in heat and all this, they know about it. So Yes, so the words don't matter, but they know that something is changing. That's right. The word, as I said, because it's an English word, people don't quite understand. But in terms of the reality, the people are fully aware of the changes in terms of the timing, uh, like the, in Port Mosby, for example, which is our national capital, it used to be the two almost... Uh, four or five months is the rainy season and then the other one is the dry season. Whereas now in Port Mosby, it's raining any time and it's unexpected. And this is what the climate change is and the people are now relating to saying, oh, so what you're talking about, the government's talking about climate change, is that it? And they said, yes, that's what it is. And do people expect governments to act or your government to act? Yes, our government has taken a very positive state. Um, last uh, 2008, our policy on the new, um, it was established in 2008. They launched it last year. And I want to commend the current government under the leadership of uh, Grand Chief Sir Michael Somare, who have launched the 2050 vision, which is um, comprised of seven main uh, goals or what they call pillars and out of that seven goals the fifth pillars or goal of the 2050 vision is on emphasizing climate change and environmental conservation. Okay I don't want to oversimplify it but w what do you think are the main or do people agree in Papua New Guinea what the main impact of climate change the one that people fear most or are most worried about? Is it, is it rain? Is it drought? Is it sea water, sea rising or what? Uh, Papua New Guinea is uh, mountainous. The mainland of Papua New Guinea is mountainous. But uh, at the moment, what is becoming more obvious is the coastal villages and the island provinces. Like we do have volcano. Uh, 1997, we have a, one of the worst tsunami which took place in the Aitape in East Sipic, West Sipic province. And even just not long ago, the Japanese tsunami, uh, we also have an impact on that. And uh, I come from Manus Island, which is a tiny the smallest province, but we experienced, uh, we were alerted by the disaster committee and the weather uh, people to be ready and accept, expect anything between 9 a.m. and 2 a.m., uh, 9 p.m. and 2 a.m., and by 11.30, 
uh, one in the morning, we could see the water rise coming through and some of our coastal and island were affected very badly from that uh, Japanese tsunami. So preparedness, disaster preparedness worked in this case for you? Yes, it's very important and uh, especially uh, we would like to, we would appreciate it if our technical scientists, people who are expert on weather and they could tell us about and at least we can, they can predict and warn us uh, that this is likely to happen. So I think the preparedness is important and I must say that we were very happy with the introduction of digital telephones and the telephones that were from where I come from it was through the telephone that people were communicating all around the island and we had a um, radio, our radio manus was open 24 hours and anyone could ring to the radio and as something happens on the island, as the sea rise came through the village, they just called back and said, oh, this is what's happening to us at the moment. And it was very, very uh, exciting and again, that is also a contribution attributed to the new technology. So. In the climate change adaptation, the technology is important, the information of awareness is important, and the government has to take a positive action to address the issue of climate change because it is um, a development issue and the difference between climate change and the other cross-cutting issues is that it's unprepared. We cannot tell when is tsunami going to come up? Or when is the climate change? Anything can happen anytime at its will, not at, in our control. I was in a session earlier and I heard you answer a question about what would you wish, if you had a single wish, what would you want government, how would you want government to act? And you said money. Do you, is, can you just explain that a little bit more? Do you think that in, in, the case, in your case, is that also true or, or is it people's experience uh, and sharing of experience that might be useful or do you think it really comes down to government allocating funds to deal with this problem? Thank you. I think when I say money, I don't mean giving money out. What I mean is that for the first time now, Papua New Guinea uh, government has um, identified climate change as a development issue. And as far as I can see, it, and I believe that it should not be left at that. It should be treated and addressed like health, like education, like uh, business, like any other government instrumentals that money must be allocated to the department so that the department can organize themselves, equip themselves with the necessary tools and human resources to get out there and carry out awareness and to implement that policy on environment and uh, sustainability and climate change because without that resources and government is responsible for that and uh, you know, it must be part of the budgetary plans and money allocation to the department. So the department, yes, we rely too on the, I must say thank you to the international donor partners who are at the moment helping us a lot. They're giving financial assistance from there. But our own government must take that responsibility because then we can build our own technical and human resources to be responsible to carry out the necessary um, information and necessary um, objectives to make sure that people are aware of the climate change. Is there a is there a gender perspective to this? You hear many people who don't you know who don't talk the lingo of, of development groups and climate groups say gender. What's it got to do with gender? Climate is changing, we must do something about it. But there are a number of sessions at this meeting uh, on on this so called gender perspective. Do you think that's a real issue? Yes, um, we call it also, uh, we relate it to climate change and uh, time are changing and the women who in Papua New Guinea who once used to take the back seat or on the periphery, today we have a number of professional lawyers, engineers, pilots, um, 
captains of the boats and everything else. So gender is also another issue that has to be, is part of our um, Papua New Guinea 2050 vision and the government has to also address that. But uh, from my own experience, to me, the, I feel that the, the key to friendly, conducive environment will depend entirely on education. And if anyone out there, uh, women or children or communities, education is the key to development. And it is only by having that uh, necessary education, quality education, we begin to respect one another, acknowledge the skills and talents that each one of us has, regardless of sex or faith or race. Because at the end of the day, the world, the community uh, needs that skilled person to introduce, to put back into the community where we come from. And do you think that climate change is, may derail Papua New Guinea's development efforts? Because like many developing countries, it's investing in education and, and pursuing a development program. Here comes another problem on top of all the other problems that could be so serious that it would it could do you think it could actually knock back the development the country's development program um, I hope not because uh, as I said at least um, of the seven pillars I can't remember all of them now but um, for the first time now the climate change has become part of that so the economic empowerment is there fair and just society is there, peaceful and economic empowerment, everything is there. So uh, the climate change is uh, not necessarily will derail other activities. It has become part of the, uh, it's a cross-cutting issues and it has to be addressed like all the other development issues and collectively be seen together because we cannot talk about climate change without talking other uh, with other activities. Let me say the example is that the climate change is now have come now. The forest degradation is one thing that we have seen. So uh, hopefully that the climate change will also support the idea that please don't cut all your logs. And I like the concept that they said, leave your tree standing and you will have a life earning. Because they said, don't cut your trees. Because Papua New Guinea has probably one of the biggest country with our, we have our greens and trees and logs are still standing there and it's uh, at least one thing it's now helping us to say rethink about logging and if we leave our trees there at least we're talking about carbon uh, dating we're talking about trading that at least just leave the trees there and it'll protect the environment okay before you rush off i know another session looming uh what about conferences? People often say, especially outsiders, say, oh, it's another conference, it's another waste of money, everyone flies here, flies back, we talk. Do you think a conference such as this is useful? Very much so. I mean, even when I told my people and relatives that, oh, I'm off to Bangladesh, and they said, what are you going to do now, not to another meeting? I said, yes, but this is one of those meetings that... Uh, for the first time, I'm going to go in here about the climate change and what is happening. And I think there is a misconception from, I can say, not only Papua New Guinea, but other people too, that uh, we spend a lot of money on conferencing. But at the same time, people don't realize, and as you can witness, and I've seen this week, and I'm very thankful that I am here. One, I learn a lot from what is happening in Bangladesh. I read and hear about the big uh, water and you know, ground, but when I saw what people are doing, uh, I'm very impressed with how and they are surviving, they're resilient about the change. I think the important things about such conferences and especially at the international level is that we come together to interact with one another, with different uh, institutions, with different experiences, and then putting together those knowledge. And I think this is where, uh, like at my session this morning, yes, it's good to come together, but let's talk globally, but act locally. 
so that at this meeting, in sharing our ideas, our experiences, and the knowledge and skills that we put together, has to be put together in either a book or an information paper that in the end all of us can take it back to our country and use it as a tool to further disseminate that information to our own community and to the where the experience is so that we can learn more and bring more because it is and uh, it's all about learning and experiencing interacting from one another and from, we learn from one another's country and I think it's very positive. Okay, thank you very much uh, Nahao Rooney, Provincial Administration, businesswoman, activist, so many hats and, and champion, <laughs> so thanks very much indeed. Champion of